And welcome to the Going Ballistic Podcast. We are in episode 34. Jason, how are you, man? I'm doing good, man. How are you doing? Good, good. I was just looking at some uh, book stats the other day, and surprise, surprise, you guys are still awesome and are still supporting the heck out of my book, and I really appreciate it. And one of the reasons I, I do the podcast is not only is it fun to catch up with Jason and to be able to share some news and things with you guys, but it's also honestly a little bit of a chance for you to give out these commercials and to mention, hey, go support my book or go support this project. And you guys do it, which is awesome. And I, I really can't thank you enough. And the charities that the book supports can't thank you enough. Uh, matter of fact, I just got back, Jason, late last week. I, I think you saw on some social media stuff I'd shared, uh, getting a chance to go stretch out the, uh, the Kleckner Rifles nitrogen uh, legs a little bit at some distance with some students. I just got back from an event for the Suisponte Foundation. That's one of the two charities that you guys support. They were holding a event out of the arena training facility near Fort Benning. And the idea was it was a lot of the, the folks have donated an awful lot or done a lot for the charity. They were able to hold this event to teach them some long range shooting and some you know, carbine training and pistol training. And it was just a couple of days of a whole heck of a lot of fun out there. So, uh, those are the kind of things that you guys have allowed me to go do and uh, charities and things like that, that you guys allow me to support because you're buying the book. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next book, not ready yet. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it yet or not, but I think I'm going to be sending out an email this week to everyone that pre-ordered the advanced edition and just saying, Hey, here's your money back. Um, I'm getting the book done. I really am. It's just, I want to have a better product than I would have if I rushed the book out. And I want to make the hard right decision, which would be to do that. Um, so it's coming soon. I don't know if it'll be done by Christmas or not, but I'm trying my best. And I know you guys are just asking, trying to help motivate me along, but I'd be further along without answering multiple emails every day <laughs> about how the book's <laughs> coming. So anyway, so what's your week look like, Jason? Oh, well, you know, tomorrow's Halloween. We always celebrate that. The house is all done up and unfortunately the new house that we're in there's not a lot of kids which we're kind of bummed about so we're going to go hang out i think over at jared's house and uh enjoy seeing all the kids come around and hand out candy we always look forward to it so bryant already uh posted a comment on the youtube live chat for those that are following along the live broadcast um yeah bryant was one of those that sent me one today he, he did it jokingly though so that's funny now can i share with people what you got semi-famous for doing for Halloween in front of your house. Oh, absolutely. It's legendary. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so you guys know by now that the Kleckner boys are big hunters. Uh, Jason may have waited until Halloween night to butcher an animal on his driveway <laughs> while the trick or treaters were coming up. Now, Jason, I didn't get to see it. Wasn't it like white apron tables, meat cleavers, lights, all sorts of scary stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We did the whole garage. Like it was a, <laughs> a mortuary's place almost. Um, and we did, we actually kept the deer on ice for a couple of days, uh, prior to Halloween. So I had cut the carcass in half and I had butchered, uh, all the rib section, the neck section and had it laying on the ground. So it actually looked like a person laying there. And then of course I had the, the back half hanging off of the garage door opener and was carving meat and packaging it. And as the trick or treaters come up, you know, you can smell the meat and they're like, is that real? I said, absolutely. It's real. And majority of the parents loved it. A couple of them didn't like it so much, but it became a thing where if I didn't kill the deer that year, there was mass disappointment. I mean, people were coming <laughs> from long ways to go. We came all this way to see something hanging, man. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I didn't get one this year or I didn't get drawn. So That's uh, awesome. the couple times that we did it, yeah, it was it was fantastic. We were known as a house that actually has animals hanging. So it was wonderful. <laughs> I'm surprised no one called the cops on you. I mean, I guess it is Phoenix still, but. Oh, no, no. I mean, like I said, majority of the people absolutely loved it. That's awesome. I wish I could have seen it. So yeah, my kids are uh, getting ready for Halloween. They're excited. I, I never knew how fun Halloween could be till I became a parent. I mean, yeah, it was great as a kid to get candy, but as a parent, it's even better. That's cool. I'm excited. 
Oh, and we love scaring kids. You know, I bust out the varmint calls, set up the remote, you know, with the, the coyotes howling over in the bushes or have a rabbit, you know, let off a scream. Oh, yeah, the rabbit call for coyotes would probably be scarier than the coyote call itself. Oh, I've had moms dump drinks on themselves. I've had people jump, run. Uh, yeah, the varmint call is fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know is. how much drinking was involved in parents for Halloween until I became a parent. Oh, yeah, the, the parents that we do know, we have a little cooler of beer, so they get a beer instead of candy and send them on their way. That's funny. We actually, in our summer neighborhood, our older neighborhood, uh, all the dads would hang out around the fire pit and hand out the candy. All the moms would go walk around with their cocktails. So that's pretty funny. I'm looking forward to Halloween. So good, man. Um, what? So last week, I speaking of social media, I was looking at you um, getting into the Halloween spirit. Uh, you were out. You weren't shooting but you were playing like you were shooting. What were you doing? So Twilight and I went to um, a place here locally called Modern Round, and they had a uh, costume contest. So naturally, we got dressed up. We went as uh, washed-up rock and rollers and a washed-up groupie, uh, which was hilarious. We ended up taking third in the costume contest and got a gift card. So Modern Round, um, it's it's kind of a laser, kind of like the cert pistols, because they have cert pistols there, but they have... Okay. Uh, CO2 driven laser guns. So you have an AR-15 platform and then you have kind of similar to a Glock platform. Um, and they take magazines. They're driven on CO2. So when you squeeze the trigger, it actually pushes the slide back and slams it back forward, gives it a little bit of a recoil. Mm -hmm. And the screen is massive. I mean, it has to be a couple hundred inch screen. No, that's that's and, just for your station. There's a bunch of screens, right? Yeah, they're all over the place. You have your own private booth. So you can play games, you know, like a shooting gallery, or you can do um, uh, dueling targets. Um, you can shoot darts. Uh, then you can pay a little bit extra money and do uh, police and military scenarios, which we like to do. So it'll be a live video uh, with actors, and it'll tell you before the video, you know, what the threat is. You know, don't shoot the bystanders and you either fail or pass based on if you don't wait until the the guy pulls a gun and or if you can take down the other guys before they shoot at you. Uh, very challenging, very hard. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I think I posted a short little video where I was trying to hold my phone on uh, Facebook where <laughs> we, you know, where two civilians hit the ground and, and I took out two bad guys, but uh, it's a blast. Um, the people there are real nice. Uh, you can order drinks, food. Um, and then you have a waitress who refills your CO2 cartridges for you as you empty them out. So as I'm shooting, I, I typically have a couple mags in each pocket. <clears throat> and then the AR, when you run out, I mean, when you pop the mag, you slap in the new mag and you have to pull back the charging handle and then away you go again. That's you, cool. Yeah. And you can calibrate the gun to your shooting style. You know, they have a calibrating area. Um, but yeah, it was a blast. So did I actually get out? and shoot any long range or rifles no but i i got to play with fake ones <laughs> hey man <laughs> for an hour and a half. you got to do something related to shooting that's kind of why i like reloading half the time is it gives me a chance to you know fiddle with guns without actually having to spend money <laughs> i can save money and, and i always have to go to the range uh, tom b has a question he said need your help to settle a disagreement buddy zeroed his hunting rifle then changed the eye relief i told him he needs three zero he thinks since it was zeroed and only moved back a quarter inch, I assume the rest of the question is that he doesn't need to. Jason, do you have any thoughts on that one? So I'm trying to understand the question. He, he zeroed his rifle, moved his scope a quarter of an inch on the rail after zeroing it. Oh, Tom B definitely. tells his buddy he needs to re-zero it. Tom B's buddy says, no, it was already zeroed and I barely moved it. Well, if you unbolted the tension alone on the scope, I would think you'd have to re-zero it. Yeah, I agree. So, um, so Tom, I'm sorry. I'm not going to have a good answer for your argument here is you both could be right. Um, you could get away with not rezeroing it at all if it works, but I would still confirm the zero. How about that, Tom? I'll put it that way. If I'm going to move my scope, I'm going to confirm the zero. So there's a great chance that it's going to be right where it needs to be. There's also a good chance that he's going to need to adjust the zero. So the best way I can argue, you know, settle that is not guarantee that it's going to be different, but I will tell you that you should always confirm the zero after moving the scope because there's a good chance that it'll move. So I hope that's fair enough for you. Yeah, I would say if you unbolted the scope and moved it 
you're never going to retighten it the same, and you'd have to re-zero it. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Good know scopes and good rings, you can. I mean, my my experience with the good scope, good rings, you can take the scope off, um, remount it back on in the same spot, and still be zeroed. Uh, but then again, you're using quality rings and a quality base, and you're using a 65 inch pound torque wrench, you know, so it's getting the same in each spot. Um, but I'd still confirm it. I would never not confirm it. So there's, there's always a chance. So I actually have made big changes and had precise cha- differences. So like, for example, I was shooting a flat base on my short barrel 308 and I obviously needed an a elevated base, an angled base. So I swapped it out, took off the flat base mounted a 20 minute of angle base to it, put the scope back on the base and headed down to the hundred yard range to re-zero it. And of course I just kind of bore sighted it and checked to see where I was close and put a sight around out there. I went, that's pretty darn close to about 20 inches. So I took my scope and I dialed down 20 minutes of angle and sure enough, it was dead on. So that rail was exactly a 20 minute rail because the only change I had to make on my scope from zeroing it from before to ch- completely changing the rail out was to come down 20 minutes and it was dead on again. I always thought that was kind of neat. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know if it ever happened again, but it happened that time. <laughs> so uh, talk about some new products that came out. Uh, Surefire came out with a new version of their XC1 pistol light. So the XC1, Jason, is the tiniest little light you can imagine. So it's like half the height of a normal pistol light. It doesn't even extend all the way down to the front of the trigger guard. Um, it, it takes one battery on one side of it and the light is like on the other side of it. So it's really, really small for like an everyday carry type thing. And I always thought it was a neat package, a neat little tiny light, but I never bought one and I never wanted one because they were momentary on only. So you had to press and hold the switch to have the light on. And the second you let go of the switch, the light would turn off which to me was the worst design possible for a light because that meant I could pull out my pistol and look and see what a target is. But the second it came time to shoot the target, my trigger finger has to come off the switch to fire the gun and a light goes off. Right. And the, you know, Surefire's answer was, oh, well, if you keep your support hand on the gun, you can use your support hand thumb to hold that switch down while you're shooting. I said, or sometimes you have to shoot with one hand. That just sounded like a horrible idea. So I really liked for the the micro or the tiny lights, I liked the Enforce APL. You know, not only is it a slick system, a slick light, it allowed you to have either momentary or constant on based on how you tapped the button or how you held it. Well, today, I think it's today, Surefire came out with the XC1 Bravo or B, and it's the same tiny package. And now they have the that toggle switch. If you just tap it real quick with your finger, you just flick it, you know, like a momentary bump it's constant on that a momentary bump takes it off, but any amount of hold to the switch, you know, more than that fraction of a second is just momentary. I think that now that's, they went from the worst design to the best design because now you can pull it out and just flick it with your finger as your finger passes by and it's going to stay on for you until you flick it off or you can press and hold it for, you know, a second or two to look at something and let go and it'll automatically turn off. So I love the, the smartness to it that allows you to go from momentary to continuous so I might be picking up one of those and letting you guys know what I think about it. Yeah, I've never had to play with a light or shoot at night for that matter. So I'm going to trust your expertise on this matter. Bad guys like the night. Yeah, that's true. So might, might, might as well have a light on the gun or might as well practice with one too. So uh, another product that came out is Mossberg came out with, if you're familiar with their 14 inch shockwave, that's the, looks like a handgun, but it's a pump action shotgun. Mm -hmm. They came out with the 20 gauge version. Well, Remington came out with the 20 gauge version at the beginning of the month. So what's funny is because Mossberg beat Remington to the market with the whole shockwave concept. And I probably already mentioned it, but if you want to go read how that shockwave thing is legal, I actually wrote a blog post for Mossberg. So you go to Mossberg's website, you can see a blog post written by me that explains the legalities of how um, that's not an NFA firearm, not a short belt shotgun, how you can have one. So then Remington finally caught on and said, well, we can do one too. So they came out with one, you know, I think it was a couple months later. Well, now Remington beat them back and they came out with a 20 gauge version earlier in the month. And Mossberg just came out this week or at the end of last week with their 20 gauge version to fight back. And I heard a lot of people say, oh, great. Now I'm finally going to get one. I got the 20 gauge. Well, I don't know, man. 20 gauges aren't as light recoiling as everyone thinks they are. Uh, I think we might've talked about this a long time ago, but 
20 gauges are deceptively heavy recoiling because they're not that much smaller than 12 gauge. They, you look at a target load, for example, which a lot of people want to shoot through these, you know, shockwave firearms because they want a lighter load. You'll look at a 12 gauge target load is an ounce and an eighth of pellets. Sometimes it's an ounce of pellets. So it's either an ounce or an ounce and an eighth of pellets going about 1200 feet a second, maybe 1100 feet a second, but somewhere in there. Okay. Let's call it 1150. Then you go look at a 20 gauge target load and you will find either seven eighths or an ounce worth of pellets going 1150 feet a second. So you have, in some cases, the exact same amount of pellets going the exact same speed out of the gun, which to me means the exact same energy for the recoil and inertia, except it's worse than 20 gauge because 20 gauges are generally lighter guns. So it's a smaller framed lighter gun. So you can actually have 20 gauges kick more and have more recoil than their 12 gauge counterpart. Now, that all goes out the window when you start shooting, you know, three inch or three and a half inch magnums, but that's not what you're shooting in these shockwave grips. So be careful. The shockwave and 20 gauge, yeah, it's smaller, but I actually think it might be more punishing to shoot. You're going to pick one of these up, Jason? No, no. I've already got my, my 12 gauge sawed off version. Um, and 20 gauge, I never really cared for it. I mean, they're always hard to find for me. Mm-hmm. I was about as 410, but you know 410 is going to come next. Yes. They're going to fight and make a, or like a 28 gauge. And just like 410, they're more expensive. Yeah. So, and I don't like, so 28 gauge, April has, my wife has a 28 gauge over and under, um, one percenter. <laughs> so <laughs> she, uh, I don't reload shotgun shells, but I have some Rubbermaid bins full of 28 gauge hulls because if I ever do, I know those 28 gauge ones are, are going to be near priceless. Well, yeah, and I hated it when we'd go out, you know, bird shooting with the boys. You know, we started them off with a bolt action 410, and it was a small fortune to yeah. buy boxes of 410 to take them out. I couldn't wait till they could upgrade. Yeah, my dad had to go through the same thing for me. I had a little single shot break open 410. Yeah. Um, I think that's the one where I completely disintegrated a, a quail or a dove, I forget, because I went to put it out of his misery. It was, uh, I shot it, landed in a bush. I went trotting on over there, and I was young. I was really young. And the thing was kind of hanging in the branches, kicking around a little bit. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to put out his misery. So I took the break open 410, shoved the barrel, and pushed, like, literally pushed the bird a little bit as the barrel's holding up against it and pulled the trigger. And did not realize that it would be hard to find feathers even when you did that. But learned my lesson. Oh, the stuff we learn as a kid. Yeah, the stuff instructing kids. Um, yeah. The first time I took Tucker out with the 410, you know, we'd been out before, but I didn't take into consideration how to properly unload the gun, you know. So I'm standing mm-hmm. there with him, and I'm like, you know, this is just like any other gun, just unbolt them out. So I'm like, hey, make sure you point that in a safe direction and unload your gun. Okay. So I look down to do mine, and boom, the gun goes off. I'm like, I look at him, all surprised. I'm all, what happened? He's all, well, I'm just unloading it. I'm just going to shoot the bullets that way. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that is not how we unload the gun. I'm glad I'm, no one got hurt. I'm glad you were in a safe direction and everything's oh my good gosh. to go. Oh, You're but, lucky, yeah. But no, 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 that's not how that works. So I was being taught by somebody when I was younger about firearm safety. And I won't say his name here, but let's just say it starts with a duh and ends with ad. And he had me out. Um, we were shooting a semi-auto pistol, and he took the magazine out, and he said, "Okay, now it's unloaded, right?" I said, "Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah." He took the magazine out. He goes, "Okay, let's take our ear protection off." We took our ear muffs off, and he goes, "Boom!" Pulls the trigger into the ground. My ears were ringing, just startled out of my skin. He goes, "Guess it wasn't unloaded, huh?" I'm like, I guess not. You know, again, it scared me, ears ringing, and then he taught me about it. And I'll never forget the lesson of, hmm, it has consequences. You got to be careful. So, oh, yeah. It's, yeah, safety is so important, but it's, it's easy. It's so easy to overlook what you think should already be known. Um, so I'm actually fighting with illustrators right now on my child, my kid's safety book. So the kid's firearm safety book is written, it's done, and I'm working with an illustrator, and it's just being a kind of a pain to get it finished all the way through because I think it's such an important deal. So once I get these artistic type illustrators to get on the ball, we'll have a book out for y'all. 
uh, on firearm safety for kids, which we're not going to teach it by, you know, Jason and Ryan, apparently (laughs) (laughs) we'll, we'll be chapter two, what not to do. So, um, I saw someone, uh, defusking on the comments on YouTube said, come to South Dakota two days. We had sustained 40 mile an hour winds wind holds for days. Why would I go there? That doesn't sound fun. This isn't a kite flying podcast. I'm just kidding. Uh, that might be fun out there for the wind. The, the facility that I was at, though, with the uh, charity, the arena training facility, man, I think my next class is going to be there. So I was leaving. I actually walked up to the guys. I'm like, hey, uh, the guy that runs it is the uh, former uh, third ranger battalion sergeant major. I just asked him. I said, hey, what's the cost to get out here? You know, what would you guys want to charge for use of the facilities? They have cabins on site, Jason. Nice. You think we we you think we could actually get you out? I know it's a long trip, but like you could sleep in your cabins. It's like summer camp for adults out there. And they have, uh, they have breaching ranges. They have ranges for like shooting uh, laws and AT4 rockets. They have, th- this facility is just huge. They're, they're trying to be a kind of an offsite military training facility. And they have a 1000 yard known distance range, which is what you're used to seeing where you have like the black and white numbers up to 10. And they right. have the target pits where you can go back there and you lift the targets up and down and put the markers in it for them. So they have one of those ranges there. And then they have a 2,200 yard unknown distance range, which is where it's just one berm. So instead of the known distance, which is the targets all in one spot, and then you have a berm at each hundred yards all the way back to a thousand, an unknown distance range has one berm that you shoot from and then just a scattering of targets throughout the field. So out to 2,200 yards, they have steel targets just all over the place. And it was oh, wow. so great to get the, the uh, nitrogen rifle out there and let people try it. And these guys that do not know how to shoot, they were safe. They were good at listening to instructions. But they don't know long range shooting. I gave them a crash course in exterior ballistics. You know, had everything set up for them and had them shoot. And most of the guys that would shoot, we started them off at 500 or 850 yards. They would take a shot. I'd have them reload. I'd talk to them about what I wanted them to do with their trigger control and, and, and focus on their platform or adjust the scope. They'd shoot again and the other students were spotting. So I don't know if it was uh, the other the other students spotting and getting excited about what they saw or the shooters, but most of the guys had the shots at a couple inches. They would shoot. They'd shoot again. And they'd go, same spot. I go, ah, no way. And I'd look at someone else on the scope. And they'd hold up their fingers and I'd like, yeah, it was about that far away. So these guys were shooting you know, a couple inch groups not groups, but two rounds of these distances. And I, I told the guys before we started, it was a two day deal. I said, I'm warning you, you're going to be spoiled. You're using the best equipment, the best ammo, the best everything. It's going to take all the fun out of the job. And every single guy hit their target within the first couple shots, no matter what distance we're shooting at. It was kind of funny. Uh, Bryant wants to know where arena training facility is. It's in Blakely, Georgia. So near Fort Benning, it's a really cool place. So yeah, man. And then I also was at, uh, I took two trips last week, another trip to Bayer, you know, the pharmaceutical company. They have a vegetation management division. I went up there and spoke to them about what I did to that pesticide group before I did the wind reading and how that applies to pesticide application. It was really fun to get to meet those people and to see how much they are interested in not having this wind overspray and how much, uh, how fun it is for me to show up in a suit being the sniper guy and not being the, the firearms executive guy. It was just, I don't know, kind of fun to see the crossover, you know? <laughs> well, it makes sense though. I mean, it's gotta be money saving for them to do these things. Yeah. There's huge lawsuits right now at the state level, even of farmers that are losing massive amounts of crops because of this overspray, it's a big deal. It's a real big deal. Um, so enough about all these things that I've been seeing. I want to hear about you and rocket FFL. Have you finished the next chapter of Rocket FFL, Jason? No, I have not. I'm still at the responsible person. Um, but I've given it a lot of thought. I would call that being at the irresponsible person, Jason. Yes, yes, I'm being the <laughs> irresponsible person. But I promise I'm going to knock it out this weekend. All right. Um, Help everyone understand what a responsible person is. Let's see if you paid attention. Oh, I paid attention to it. So a responsible person is a person that you want to put on your FFL. That in case something happens to you, you don't have to deal with all the legalities and all the things that come with trying to see where the firearms or any of your your products and things are going. Um, and it has to be a person who can pass all the list of things such as, you know, uh, no felonies, not an illegal alien, pretty much a person who can buy a gun. 
Yeah, it um, really is. It really is. Um, People think, oh, there's no way I can get an FFL. If you can buy a gun, you can get an FFL. Right. The exact then, same background check, the exact same questions, everything. Yeah, and that's kind of my easiest explanation of a responsible person. Yeah, if you right. can buy a gun, you can be a responsible person on the FFL. Yeah, the only thing I would add is you're right. Though it's they can't be a prohibited person, right? So prohibited persons are that whole all those categories of people that can't buy guns. So you can't be a prohibited person, but also the responsible person is who the ATF has the relationship with, right? Because the ATF doesn't can't talk to a business; they can only talk to people. So not just the responsible person that you want to have on your license in case something happens. Everyone, you are a RP or a responsible person on your license. So responsible person is anyone who can direct and control the operations of the FFL. It's essentially who has the authority to act as the FFL. And I hate to say it, but who's going to be in trouble when something goes wrong. So it is the actual people that are on the license itself. And there's a lot of, a lot of things you can do as an RP. I mean, you, you literally can make the decisions and sign for guns and, and the transfers and things like that. But yeah, you got you got to be careful who you set it up with and how you take care of it. So cool, man. You, you're you're learning you're learning stuff. I appreciate you checking it out. Oh yeah, and I'm I'm really torn. Um, I'm I'm really weighing out whether I want a Type One or Type Seven. Um, I keep going back and forth. You know, I'll do the Type One now, which is more than likely what's going to happen. But I I really have an itch to do a Type Seven. And so, what's the hang up between the two? Um. Just pulling the trigger on, you know, I'd like to build some AR-15 platforms and sell them as mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've looked into, uh, you know. How bad do you want to do that, though? Is that just, would that be a nice to have? Because you're talking a lot more money just to be able to have that nice to have. No, I, I really think it's something that I, I might enjoy doing. And if it. Building if, them or having your name on them? Uh, both, of course. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, what are you going to call it? What are you going to call it? The real Kleckner rifles? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's another thing coming up with names. I've been trying to think of names all week. So, um, as you know, my favorite number is 333. So, yeah. of course, I'd have to incorporate that into it somehow. Um, but I've really been looking into uh, how to Cerakote. Uh, yeah. I actually mm-hmm. checked out. Uh, they have their training course that you can take, two-day training course. Uh, I've read all their manuals online. So, as I'm doing the FFL, I think I'm going to do another AR build, um, have it all done, bill it, bare mm-hmm. aluminum. I'm going to order the Cerakote in, play with it. Uh, my wife doesn't know yet, but I may have to actually use our oven until I can build an oven to cook it. Ah. <laughs> I'm not going to tell her that, though. So if you Cerakote at the direction of somebody else, you know, so somebody sends you a gun and says, hey, will you Cerakote this for me, this color, this pattern, you don't need the manufacturing license, right? You're just a gunsmith. You know, clearly, and even for State Department, for ITAR purposes, you don't need a man. You don't need to register uh, under ITAR, which can save a lot of money. But once you're making them from your inventory for sale to the general public, okay, now you're a manufacturer, and you need to worry about that. So be careful there. Yes, and and that's why I would be looking at the Type Seven. So this one I'm going to do for myself is more of a test to see how I do, which will kind of help answer whether I push that envelope or not. Right, but. But I, I, I think I could do it. I got some cool ideas and patterns I'd like to do. Um, and then if I continue with that, there's actually some changes I would like to make to a lower um, and possibly talk to a couple of machining guys I know and, and see what's involved with some. Here's the chance, man. These places have machine time. You know, they, they, they have the downtime to be able to make them for you because the manufacturers have already stocked the supply chain. So it's, it's already full. So you're, you're striking at the perfect time. Don't wait. You might regret it. Right. So, so those are, those are the things that are going on in my mind with it right now. Cool, man. Cool. Um, I, I kind of feel like wrapping it up. We didn't have any big news this week. I mean, we were all counting on Jason having more of the rocket FFL done. So, uh, uh. Uh, we actually need to send you, get you through Rocket C- Tell you what, so Rocket CCW, for everyone listening, it's free firearms training already, so I can't give you free training. It's already free. Um, go check it out. It's extremely basic. Again, it's just a check, a box to apply for a CCW or a concealed weapons permit that allows you to carry in over half the country. And uh, it's been amazing how many people have gone to check out the site. We've, we've literally had thousands of people so far. Um, 
but yet there's still people that need to be convinced. Well, I don't know if I want that CCW or I don't know if that would really help me. Okay, fine. You don't want it. Don't do it. But again, you, you have free training. And if someone gets a gun, they should definitely get better training than what I'm offering them through Rockout CCW. But if they just got a gun and have no idea where to even start, you know what the basic rules of firearm safety are, send them my way. It's going to be free. I mean, I'm not going to you know get mad at them for not buying the certificate at the end. That's the whole point of it being there is to to get some free training to share with everybody. So I'd really appreciate it. Um, if you guys are interested, but the money's holding you back, I mean, let me know. I, I, I could try and figure something out, but I think it's pretty reasonable. You can pay 40 bucks and in 20 minutes you can be qualified for a CCW. And your other option is to find a local class to go sit there for eight hours while someone tells you which end of the gun is the noisy end. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually think it's worth a lot more. I've had a couple of people tell me, you're only charging $40. I would pay so much more than $40 to not have to find a class, schedule the class, make sure it fit within your calendar and your life, and then go give up eight hours of your, your life to sit there and listen to that. I'd pay way more than 40 bucks. Maybe they're right. I don't know, but I like it, the price where it's at. So I'd appreciate I if you guys checked it out. Yeah, shoot, man. So what if, and I don't have one because in Arizona you don't need one, but... If you already but had, you should get this one, Jason. You're yes. signing up for this next. Yes, I actually All have right. already signed into it. I just haven't done it yet. Um, but if you already had a concealed weapons, let's say for Arizona, does it still cover all 32 states, or is it strictly the? Virginia? Ask that question again. If I already had my Arizona, yep. CCW. Yes. Does it cover the same states as the Virginia one? Oh, probably a lot of them, but there's going to be there's more than likely ones that are new too. And the difference is you don't need a permit in Arizona. Right. So if you live in Arizona and you want to carry in 32 states, which I doubt they're the exact same states, you're probably going to get some more states out of it for 40 bucks. But if you don't have your CCW yet, you can either go sit in a class and train and take this course to get it. Or you can just in 20 minutes get one that's going to get you the same other state. So you'd still be good in Arizona regardless because you don't need a permit. But then you can get all those extra states for... 20 minutes and 40 bucks. I think that's right. a good deal. So Casey then, asked, does the CCW permit rocket qualifies you for give you different States than Arizona? That's essentially what just Jason asked. I have no idea, uh, Casey and Jason, but we should look it up, you know, go see, um, what reciprocity the Arizona CCW has versus a Virginia non-resident, or you can just go look at rocket CCW.com. I have a map with all the States highlighted in orange that the non-resident Virginia CCW is good for. And if it helps you out, it helps you out. But even if it's only a couple states, it's I think it's a pretty small charge to have all this overlapping coverage for you. And then like Casey asked, he said, of course, you know, if you had your Arizona CCW, you don't have to wait for the background check, which is true. But if you have an out-of-state, a non-resident CCW, I don't think that applies. Correct. Um, so the background check is only per state. The ATF will only allow... Um, a background check to be skipped for certain states. So on Rocket FFL, I actually have a blog post which lays out what all the states are. And because this the state uh, requirements for their CCW has to meet a certain standard in order for the ATF to agree, that's just as good as uh, skipping a Brady background check. Uh, as Casey says, the state CCW lets, lets you get more places. Yeah, I completely get it. I moved out right when constitutional carry came. So I, I agree when having them, but most people I know try and get their state and then they try and get like a Utah or they try and get like a Virginia or things like that. So they can supplement their license and get coverage across as much of the country as possible. And I think that's great. And this isn't even the best permit necessarily to get. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this is a permit I can get you in 20 minutes. So you could be laying in your bed with your iPhone in your hand and get qualified completely for the permit. And then you get a guide afterwards that you can sign up for that walks you through every single step of the process, like a checklist on exactly what to do, what to fill out where on the fingerprint card, everything like that. And you'll be up and running versus, I don't know, getting your Utah and you actually have to sit there for hours and hours on a day that hopefully you are free. And I bet you're paying a lot more than 40 bucks. So that's all. It's one of those things. You don't want it, don't get it. But if you're looking for one, I, I, I think it's the best option you can do. Oh, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm going to do it. And who knows, maybe I'll have both the Arizona and the Virginia one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you should. I'll pay for it for the process for you to go through and see if it works and when, what you think about it. Uh, so Hurricane asked, are there any articles or resources you would recommend on learning how to break down a mill dot 
uh, reticle to within 0.1 mils fast and accurately. Hurricane, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Are you meaning by looking at the reticle and being able to you know, visually discriminate between tenths of a mil? Or are you talking about just how to use the reticle and, and with your church and things like that? So if you got some time before we wrap it up, uh, let me know. Joe, thanks for ch- your tuning in and hanging out with us, man. Uh, take care. Everybody else, I think we're ready to wrap it up. Jason, are you? Yeah, it's a Halloween week. Everybody's got to finish carving pumpkins and all that yep, jazz. No doubt. Uh, you guys, I started a the Trigger Words podcast on the Farms Radio Network. Go check it out. We we covered this week. It got released this morning. Uh, all the firearms definitions and what makes a firearm, what's a rifle versus what's a shotgun and things like that. So if you're a geek like me and you like that kind of thing, uh, check it out. But this foundational things that we're covering now are, are going to be important when we start talking more about um, how to travel with guns or you know how to do transfers and things like that. So Jason, man, I appreciate it. Busy week. Uh, we kind of had to bounce around on a bunch of topics this week, but I'm, I'm glad you made it. I, I really appreciate you coming in. And most of the feedback I get, this is true, most of the feedback I get is they like just the banter between you and I. So for those people that want that, guess what you got this week? Jason and I bantering. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. All right. Talk to you, everybody, next week. Take care. Have a happy Halloween. Thanks again, Jason. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. All right.